Okay, so our last lecture. Yeah, since it's our, our last lecture, um, and the rest of the quarter is a lot of it's like you guys working on your own design, make sure to reach out to us if you have any questions. Um, it's gonna be a little harder for us to make announcements. So definitely if you see us post something on the page, check it out. We'll try to keep it like uh, minimal but so there's not too many posts. But uh, yeah, it's gonna be like our main way to contact you guys. So just keep a lookout on the page. Um, first announcement is uh, this time try to set up for a design review as soon as possible. That way we can like solidify the schedule. Um, this design reviews are gonna be at the end of week eight. Um, so it'll be that Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I believe. Um, yeah, just follow uh, that sheet. Um, by that time, your next design review, you should have a completed schematic for your board. So this is uh, so like everyone did their design reviews. Um, all the changes should be implemented by then, in addition to all the new stuff. And then because of that, everything should be interconnected and properly working in theory, and will be fully ready to uh, make the full uh, the actual PCB the first maybe third of next quarter cool so some random announcements so we're gonna have a social this friday i didn't announce it earlier but i mean aaron have been playing and do that um just it's just for ap um we'll play like jackbox among us and other stuff um please try to come out i know a lot of you guys said that you guys wanted to do it early on um and if it's just me and aaron then it's just me and aaron so <laughs> yeah try to come out to that um if you really want to come and then this time doesn't really work, you can talk to us maybe we'll change it. But second thing is GB into a session. If you don't know what GB is, it's really it's really cool. It's a uh, it's kind of like if you think of like ACA or like other orgs where they have like a family system. It's kind of like a family system, but with actually officers. Uh, there'll be a lot of different like types of families. So there's some that like are like kind of like uh, pre board so like like letting you like kind of follow along and see what they do. There's a lot that are um like project oriented although i don't know if that's going to happen this year um and then the rest uh, are like social mm. and both me and aaron are doing gb so yeah come on to the info session and then hopefully you can like meet new people uh, we got like a family uh the, the other external thing is that idea hacks coming up idea hacks are really cool and they've been working really hard to make it work remotely so it's definitely a really unique experience especially for people that Mm, uh, want experience, but unfortunately, because of COVID, can't get as much. Um, yeah, Idea Hacks is a really cool experience. So uh, check that out on the website. You can just Google Idea Hacks and you'll find their website. Uh, okay, a few other things is we'll be releasing a shipping form, uh, like a shipping details form for winter because we're going to ship parts out for you for next year's labs. So um, yeah, just keep an eye out for that. And then lastly, it's just for the last parts of the design view, um, try to ask us questions. Um, there's a lot of information and details that we can't exactly cover here because it might not be applicable to everyone, but definitely me and Aaron like have experience. And if you guys are given like a specific problem with like a specific part that you guys chose, um, yeah, we'll gladly work with you and hopefully streamline the process. So um, try to come through our lab hours, but if you can't, you can just message us or schedule with us and we can help work with you. Even if you guys say like, oh, me and uh, our group is planning to like meet during this time. Um, if I don't have anything, I'll try to schedule it so that your, that time's free, just so you guys can hop in and ask questions. So, yeah. Okay, and you wanna go? Wait, I need to move into my room real quick. Can you do this part? Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, so our goal for today's lecture is, um, it's to finish the rest of the circuit, right? And the rest of the circuit is, uh, if you look at the last three sections, it's an MCU, an oscillator, and a uh, reset switches. And oh, and also you'll need a uh, radio and IMU. Um, we'll go over what all that is. So um, the goal today is uh, so what we're missing right now, right? So we have like all the drivers in, set in stone, all the power set in stone. Now we need our actual digital logic. So um, that'll be coming from the MCU. It'll take data from a radio, uh, 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 IMU, which is a type of sensor. Um, and then we'll send it, uh, it, uh, signals into the MCU by the radio to control our drone. The oscillator is to help the MCU work, which we'll talk about later, and then reset which is the exact same thing. So today what we're trying to talk about then is how do we communicate between these different modules? Because we're going to have the radio module and IMU and also an MCU, and they all need to be able to communicate with each other. Um, so we're going to be talking about communication protocols, uh, how data is stored, and then hopefully be ready to implement all of this uh, for the rest of the quarter. So yeah. Okay. The, oh, 
Okay, you can, you can go. <laughs> no, no, go for it, go for it, go for it. I'm okay, so uh, today we're going to be going over uh, data and communications protocols, and namely SPI and I2C, and how the radio module and the IMU are going to be uh, interacted with using those communication protocols, along with the remaining subcircuits for the PCB. So as a review, we'll go over like bits and bytes with respect to how, uh, how information is stored and transmitted in our, uh, in our quad. So binary is, uh, so you guys are going to learn about this more in depth in like classes such as uh, ECM16 or the math equivalent uh, or CS equivalent. I think it's like uh, CSM51, I think maybe. I don't know, but uh, so we'll just go over like a brief review. So starting with binary, it's a base two numbering system denoted with a zero B prefix in our code. And it only has values of zero or one. And there's also hexadecimal, which is a base 16 denoted with zero X. And values range from zero to F. So it would be essentially uh, all, all 16 different values. And it's used to express really long binary numbers. And a bit is also the most basic unit for expressing information. And a bit holds a single binary value, whereas a byte is a combination, combination of eight bits. And a, namely, we use bytes because addressing bytes is significantly more efficient than addressing each individual bit, which can waste a lot of like valuable flash memory in our MCU. So funny story, um, when Eric was uh, developed, like testing out the quad earlier, we were, there's like a, something called a hardware abstraction layer or HAL for a quad. And he was running into an issue where there wasn't enough flash storage on the uh, on the MCU to store the uh, all of the code that we were trying to import. So he had to shrink the size of he had to condense the code a lot. So flash is pretty valuable in our application, and uh, bytes are also considered a fundamental unit of data. And typically, you can only access full bytes in memory. And so next let's go on to like a kind of uh, high level overview of how information is stored. So we have flip-flops, which is also another like structure that you'll learn in M16 or M51. And it's a combination of hardware logic gates that store the state of an input. So in the image on the bottom right, you'll see that's like a very simple representation of a, uh, a register. And fundamentally, it's pretty similar to a flip-flop as well. So a flip-flop holds one bit that can be either one or zero. And registers are an array of flip-flops that hold a byte or more. So the way this uh, circuit on the bottom right works is um, at the clock, the input D is updated so that Q outputs whatever D is going into D at each clock pulse. And each bit or multiple bits can control certain aspects of a system. So like um, in our MCU, a certain register controls a pin, a pin output. And that's essentially how that works. <clears throat> and so reading from registers is on an MCU is identical to like checking a variable. So essentially trying to access a variable in C, you just read it. Whereas in Oh, oh, next slide. <laughs> so it, since we're using like an external IC for a lot of information, we need to utilize a communication protocol. And the MCU transmits information to the IC, telling it which register to read from. And then it sends that data back to the MCU. And all of this is done through communication protocols. And some things that we're probably going to want to read from our external ICs, such as the radio and the IMU. Uh, the radio, we want the inputs from our drone controller. And we're also, yeah, and then uh, with from the IMU, we want the gyroscope and accelerometer data. And there's also something called an acknowledge bit that Eric's going to go over when he's going over the communication protocols. And that's, a, that, it's essentially a bit that acknowledges, oh, are you ready to send data or are you ready to transmit data? And writing to registers, same for the MCU. It's very similar to just like in a C program where you're just assigning a value. Whereas in an integrated circuit, it also like uh, reading 
You also require a communication protocol when writing. So the MCU transmits to the IC which register it wants to write to, and the MCU also sends the data that it wants the uh, IC to write. And then based on the signal that the IC receives, it changes and updates the value in said register. So some things that we might want to write. So radio, we're going to be uh, writing in the transmission speed for uh, our data transmission between the radio module and the MCU, and also return data for debugging. For example, uh, acknowledge information and uh, whether or not you've received certain signals. And for the IMU, we want to write uh, the acceler uh, sorry the gyroscope and accelerometer sensitivity values. So those are going to be values that we're going to be developing, uh, not developing, but acquiring and also commands to read. Great, so, so that's like the overview of kind of like uh, what, uh, why we need communication protocols, right? Because the way that uh, a sen uh, the, these sensor modules and uh, the radio work is that whenever they have data ready, they'll store it into a register that can be accessed externally. So they'll, they'll have all the calculations and stuff within itself and digital logic, and then it stores that into a register and then for us, we want to read through that register. Or in other cases, we want to be able to preset like, oh, let's set the uh, sensor sensitivity to like uh, like zero to two Gs because we're only reading like uh, the accelerate, accelerometer from like gravity, right? So in this case, um, we need to set a communication protocol so that we're not just sending random signals between each other and they actually are uh, robustly documented as what uh, this data, what data this uh, these electrical signals will, uh, electrical signals represent. So for our applications, we'll go over UART, SPI, and I squared C, um, and they all have different benefits and drawbacks. Um, and we're fun fact, we're actually all using all three of them. We'll kind of go over why. So first is UART. UART is probably the thing that most of you guys uh, would interact with immediately, like uh, first in terms of communication protocol. Um, it would be like on an Arduino, uh, where you talk between two Arduinos, you would have a TX and RX pin. And so it, for UR, you would have two wires are used for communication. And often throughout this lecture, I'll be using the term bus. A bus is just a system in which data is transmitted over, so like a wire, or like in this case, the two wires, TX and RX. So TX is used for transmitting data out of the device, and RX is used for receiving data into the device, which is why between two different modules, one's TX, which is where they transmit, is being connected to the other's RX, which is where they receive. So this is serial communication. And what serial means is uh, that its bits are uh, sequentially uh, sent instead of, as opposed to parallel, where you have multiple wires sending at the same time. It's asynchronous, because uh, which means that you have to match baud rates uh, in order to actually communicate with each other, because um, they have to know how long each bit is going to be in order for us to know this is one bit. If you have your baud rate at like half of the other one, then obviously you're uh, going to be reading two bits, assuming it's one bit, which wouldn't really make sense. It's like reading a word and then omitting every other uh, letter, you know. So both si devices are able to sim simultaneously send and receive data because we have a TX line and an RX line. And, and neither device are classified as master or slave. And you might not know what this means, but we'll go over what it means later. It just means that they're able to send data without uh, anyone telling them to. So it's kind of a, uh, they're able to send data just to the line and with no other condition. So it's a really simple uh, communication protocol. So we use this to debug with our computers. We're gonna ask you to uh, have the MCU have two breakout pins where we can connect externally um, TX and RX. And that way we can connect it to this thing called a UART to USB bridge, which will let us uh, read uh, what we're trying to send out to us uh, over um, the computer. And this is really useful when you first start up your MCU to see if it's actually like working. So, all right, and I should probably say one more thing about this is that you are, the, the problem with you are is that you, you need to know when data, uh, when um, data really starts and ends, you know, uh, like when each transmission begins and ends. So you have to send start bits and stop bits uh, as data like a start bit and then your data and then stop it in order for people to be able to sync up where your words begin and end. All right, so SPI is the second communication protocol, also very common. Um, it uses three plus N wires, and we'll go over which, what, the, what this means, um, where N is the number of slave devices. 
So in this case, we have this thing called a master and a slave. And in a lot of types of communication, like Bluetooth, SPI, I2C, you'll have to have masters in order to initiate communication. Um, so in this case, let's just go over the lines are. Uh, so SDL is going to be a clock signal. And a clock signal is used to synchronize the data transmission so you don't have to have a preset baud rate. It's kind of like with the register, how you would have a uh, changing clock signal and on like a rising edge or a falling edge, you update the register. That's exactly what's happening here in SPI. Um, your clock would basically be uh, the timing for when your bits uh, starting. So MASI and MISO, uh, MASI means uh, master output, slave, put, uh, slave input. MISO is master input in slave out. And it's kind of like TXRX, but in this case, it's more unified because you don't have to swap the lines. You just know it's a, uh, like the, the master output slave input is the same for both as opposed to like TXR, so we have to switch it on the other module. And this allows us to be able to uh, increase the number of modules we have. Um, so we can, even if we have like uh, these two data lines, we can have uh, four modules communicating with each other. And this is why we need a master in, in this to kind of organize and tell these, S these slaves when they are allowed to communicate, because you don't want to run into problems where um, two slaves are trying to communicate on the same line. The last line, which is the plus N, which each slave needs its own line for, is called slave select or chip select or slate, uh, N slave select or chicken. There's so many words for it, just don't get confused. You see SS, CS, NSS, CE, and NCS, all these mean the same thing. And this is a uh, use to designate which slave the master is trying to talk to. So it will um, turn that on when it's uh, trying to communicate with that slave specifically. So this kind of, if you uh, are kind of confused about the synchro synchron uh, synchronizing of the data, SCK here is the, your clock line. And you can see, let's say this is the a CPLL, which just means that it's on the rising bit, a uh, rising clock edge that bits are transferred. So you can see that this bit is centered around this rising clock edge. Um, and this is why we're going to need an external clock to be able to increase our transmission rate, because your data the transmission rate is completely limited by what uh, your, your clock frequency. Um, so in this case, your the master is sending something which is what, uh, what 262 and MISO is 134 for doing like unsigned ints. Um, and then the register gets updated on the rising clock signals. Um, and then here SS being low is just opening the communication channel. Um, and low is always active in this case. So wait, let's just make sure. Yeah, OK, that's good. So, oh, any questions here, by the way? CPHA. So this will be more specific. Um, you'll have to, so basically, whenever you define SPI, you have to uh, um, define, like, uh, whether you're communicating on the rising or falling. I, I have to get back to you. In a second, Aaron, can you Google that? I don't remember the exact definition. But it's just changing the uh, initial, it's always zero or one, and it's just changing the, the uh, communication that you're using. Typically, we'll be using a very standard one, which is Z on both sides of MISO. Oh, um, that is um, where I, I, I think it has to do with. Um, the channel being uh, open. Um, it's just part of the communication protocol. Um, so when you, the thing about this is that you'll never have to actually write this bitwise communication. It's just important for you to understand um, what exactly is going through these lines when you're designing your PCP. And I won't go into too much detail, but you'll see why when you, as you actually design the line. Um, I think that is uh, opening it so that you have like a really high resistance on it um, for the reason that when you have uh, so your master output slave input is always driven by your uh, your master. So it doesn't really matter what's happening on the line. On the other hand, with MISO, you'll have multiple slaves being connected to it. So it has to have a high impedance so that if the uh, slave were to, a, a different slave were to drive the input high, you wouldn't have this like uh, volt, uh, high, uh, high volt to ground shorting. Does that make sense? It's just an interfacing thing to make sure that uh, uh, the data is, when it's transmitted, is isolated from each other. Also, an update on CPOL and CPHA. So, there, so CPOL and C, 
fey, I guess you could call it like fey, because um, it's it stands for clock polarity and clock phase. Where so for clock polarity, it's uh, it determines the polarity of uh, whatever signal you're sending. So it zero or one determines uh, active high or active low respectively, and then C P H A determines whether it reads data on uh, trailing edge or leading edge respectively for zero and one. I think like, yeah, in that case, like two of them are also like the same, but I just think it's real easier for some hardware design to make more sense than you have to. Yeah. But so I think it's like one, one and zero, zero are the same. But anyways, we'll keep going. So, oh yeah, one more thing I want to mention about this. And what it's important to notice here, just like in UART, you have what is called a full duplex, which means that you can transmit both from the master and the slave at the same time, effectively increasing your transition speed or your throughput by, by two, a factor of two. Okay, so what is a radio module? A radio module is a, mo a, a, a module that can modulate. Uh, the module and modulate don't have anything to do with each other, by the way. But it, it can, it's a system that can modulate and demodulate radio signals so that and uh, convert it into bits and bytes for us to be able to read. Um, so it allows us to wirelessly communicate by taking whatever radio frequency there is and then um, finding the, the digital data that's being sent and then have, letting us access that data from an instrument. Um, so many of you actually might not be able to get to using this um, simply because there's a lot of steps to uh, get before you can be like, I'm going to control this drone. Um, we cut out some stuff to help you guys get there much easier. Uh, so we're going to save this topic for later on in the year just so we can get there faster, right? So because a lot of times we, we used to go over this topic and then like a bunch of people don't use it. So it ends up being like a, a waste of like a third of a quarter. So, but however, like we're planning for you to get there. So you still want to implement your board so you have the option to use it, right? Um, for our radio module, we're going to be using SPI, which is why I'm mentioning it here. And this is kind of the pinouts, which I won't go into too much detail over, but it's pretty much what we're talking about. In this case, uh, CE and CS are essentially the same thing. I won't go over the reason why they're, they're uh, both here. It's in the data sheet, but they will be connected to the same thing on your MCU. Okay, any questions about SPI? Nope, okay. So we're gonna move on to I squared C, which is the last uh, communication protocol that we need to talk about. Um, it's actually, it's very, very commonly used for many reasons. Um, it's, uh, it, one of the reasons is it's a serial communication protocol that is synchronous, but only uses two wires. And the way that we kind of cut wires out from SPI is one, having a single data line instead of a master output slave input, and then having a uh, no chip select and chip enable, which we'll have to account for during our communication protocol. So in terms of hardware, it's very simple. In terms of software, it's a little bit more complicated than SPI, um, SPI is. But it's a really well-documented uh, communication protocol, so that's not a big problem. So SDA is used for transferring data. SCL is, used, is the proxy bill, that's all. Um, yeah, so we don't have a slave select or a MISO MOS slash MOSI, but they're combined. And what this uh, I squared C is best known for is being able to allow communication for multiple slaves and multiple masters, which is really unique. It's not too important for our case, we're at, but uh, we're, um, we're actually after the fact that well, the reason we're using I squared C is because one, we can, and then the second we have, there's only two wires. It saves a lot of space. Um, so it's just much simpler for our small PCB. Um, yeah. So here's something I need to talk about in order to, to also understand some of the hardware differences between I squared C and SPI, and hopefully be able to abstract that into uh, the differences between the two. So. The way that uh, you can think of a data line being brought to high and brought to low to represent digital data, you have two main ways. One is called push-pull, which is what SPI uses. On um, the transmitter, whichever is transmitting, like the master, the slave, will drive the voltage up and down by pulling in up and down, like having a voltage source with like a pull, pull up resistor or a pull down resistor or something. Uh, however, um, the problem with this in I squared C is that there are a few reasons you don't want to do this. And it's kind of the same thing, how, why there's like the Z um, for the uh, um, um, MISO. 
is because when you have multiple things connected to it and you were to push with one and pull with the other um, or push with one and just have it open on the other or draining on the other, then you'll have a short. Um, so in, in this case, in XGRPC, we use this thing called open drain protocol, where the data lines have a pull up resistor, first of all, so they can all match to the same voltage level. And uh, what, whoever is trying to transmit data will pull the line down to initiate uh, transmission, if that makes sense. So if you're trying to run it zero, you would uh, drain, which would bring the voltage down. And if you were to um, transmit a one, you would open, which would bring it up to five volts in this diagram. Uh, I was supposed to ask that question of why I C needs to use open drain. I'll still ask it now just to make sure you guys are listening. But I kind of gave the answer already. <laughs> Anyone know? Anyone? Nobody knows. Uh, is, is that just to prevent the shorting that you're talking about? Yeah, exactly. That's it. <laughs> um, but one thing is that I noticed that, like, we, even though I showed this diagram, you don't have to do this pull up resistor yourself. The main reason being that, uh, well, the only reason being that in our case, we have only one master. And so we can, within ma uh, these pins, they can set an internal pull up resistor on its own. So you don't have to do this on your own. Uh, you don't have to actually write it in. You can just omit the, those resistors and the five volts and your master will, which is the MCU, will provide the voltage for us. Yeah. Okay. So here we can talk start talking about the differences between I2C and SPI. First big difference, the number of lines. The reason we use SPI for radio is because they only have SPI on their radio. They don't have I2C pins, which is Kind of annoying, but uh, it's just how it is. But then the reason we use I C on the IMU is because it works, which we'll cover in the second, you know, part of right here. Um, and it's also less lines, and much simpler to implement for hardware. The problem with I C though is it's half duplex. Um, I C basically is a lot slower, and here are the reasons why. So first of all, it's half duplex, meaning that you can, uh, if a master and slave are trying to talk to each other. Um, they can only, only, it can only be transmitted in one direction. So our data can only be transmitted in one direction. So ma the master has to start data and then stop and then let the slave uh, communicate back to it. Whereas SPI, we can double the speed by having full duplex. Now I2C uh, has a, a, a cap in uh, data transmission rate just from a hardware limitation uh, of about 100 to 400 kilohertz. That's a, like the uh, recommended like you know like range of data transmission, whereas SPI can go up to around fifty megahertz, which is many times larger, like hundred times larger. Um, so yeah, so um, and it can go up to like eighty in some cases if you have really robust hardware. Does anyone have an idea of why this is? This is a really um hardware related question that I'm sure people will be like asking in interviews to understand. Like any guesses are good. There are many reasons, but so if no one has any, any, then I will just go for it. But try to remember it because trust me in your life it'll come in handy. Um, First of all, this is actually one of the questions that uh, the reasons why I got to be AP lead because I answered this question quickly. So, um, like I said earlier, SPI would have a pull resistor. These lines are normally very long, and because there's a pull resistor, there's an inherent. Well, first of all, these long lines because this area um, will store charge because let's say uh, uh, like uh, if SD is high and SDL is low, so it's like a capacitor in a sense. And in here, there's also a resistor connected to it. So in order for it to change its voltage, it has to fully drain all the, all the charge on the line in order to reach a low voltage. So in that sense, there's a much higher time constant, RC time constant, uh, and much longer transients um, as opposed to SPI. Um, so that is one of the reasons that it makes it like many times slower. Mm. And then the other reason is one, once again, half duplex as opposed to full duplex. 
And the last reason is because in I squared C, since we don't have a chip select line like in SPI, um, we actually have to communicate. I'm going to write. Uh, you you first start initiate data, and then you say you write out what the device's address is. Each device will have its own unique address, and then um, with that, then it'll initiate communication. So you have to like write for each byte. You have to write the address of the device, and then like oh the address of the register, and then like whatever data you're trying to communicate, um, which effectively ha halves it again. So. Just fun facts and uh, really hardware related. And the last thing is just that there are multiple masters and multiple slaves for ISO C, which isn't too important for us, but might be useful for you in the future. Any questions about this? No? Okay. So, mm, oh, one more thing too, and you might be wondering then if we want to have a lot of data from the IMU. Why don't we have, try to use SPI to make it faster? Um, it's because the, the IMU is actually the data rate is limited at around like I'd say like eight kilohertz. I think it's one to eight kilohertz, so it's much slower than whatever this is. Okay. On that note, what is an IMU? So IMU stands for. Oh wait, Aaron, you're doing this part, right? Or yeah, I, I could just do MCU if you want to do this. Part. Oh, I, I'll do this part. Yeah. So an IMU is an iner inertial measurement unit. So it has to do with basically a lot of sensors. It's for us, it's equipped with a gyroscope and accelerometer. Um, we're not going to go into detail about what these two uh, uh, parts, uh, the gyroscope and the accelerometer, and how we're going to use it to find your drones like orientation. Um, we're going to cover that next quarter. But for now, what you need to know is the lines and the type of communication we're using in order to communicate with these two modules. So it'll use I squared C. Uh, IMU will use uh, I squared. Uh, the IMU will use I squared C. Um, it has to be powered by 3.3 volts of ground as well. Um, and for um, yeah, yeah, that's that, that's all pretty much. I just realized I was muted, but uh, yeah. So essentially. Um, so we're going to be covering like the remainder of the subcircuits for our quad from this point on. And there aren't too many things. So it's just the uh, MCU and the reset and oscillators and reset switch left. So it'll be almost there, almost there on the home stretch now. So for with regards to the MCU, it handles all of the processing for our quad copter. So it's basically kind of like the, uh, the CPU in a computer, right? And uh, unfortunately, it's not as simple as just like plopping it on our PCB and like connecting all the pins to everything that we need. We need to, uh, we still need to connect all the uh, other sub circuits that we've created for checkpoint one, such as uh, the voltage regulator, all of our motor drivers and everything. Oh, awesome. And so, so the reason for this line too is because even though like you have like the, in order to make the MCU work, it's not just power. Um, there's gonna be a few other uh, um, pins that need to be connected in certain ways. Um, for it to work. So you guys have to read the data sheet on that. Yeah. And so uh, we've stated in the lab spec that we recommend all teams use the uh, STM 32F411 series of uh, MCUs. And the RCT6 is just like the SMD individual component version of it. And you can select your own if you want, but it'll be really difficult for Eric and I to uh, help you debug if any issues arise. And so, as I mentioned earlier, the MCU handles a lot of things on our quad. So, namely, they'll have to communicate with uh, both the IMU and our radio. Uh, radio will come later. Sensors are more important for now. And uh, they all, they're also responsible for driving the motors, computing all of the uh, feedback controls that we're going to be implementing, along with storing the code that we upload and accessing in data within it. And uh, some things that our MCU still requires include decoupling caps to reduce noise and maintain like, uh, so that errors don't arise in the data we collect, along with an external oscillator that we'll talk about in a second to improve our uh, communications speed and uh, like consistency. And also a control voltage source, which is the duty of our uh, voltage regulator subcircuit along with other caps and passive elements that are specified within the data sheet of our MCU and 
Um, they, I believe they include like all the values and stuff as well. So that should be relatively easy. We saw some teams have already started uh, adding in components to their uh, schematic as defined by the uh, data sheet. So good job on that. And we'll also need a reset switch and which we'll also be going over in a second. And um, yeah, so, yep. yep. And you guys. <laughs> And so next goes on to why do we need to choose the right pins for PWM and serial communication? So certain pins on our MCU can do certain specific things, but not, not all pins are built equally. So you may think that like a general purpose input output or GPIO pin can like turn off and off like really rapidly. And that technically is true, but it's pretty difficult to implement uh, PWM if you're just like rapidly turning it on and off without and also if you're trying to communicate like bitwise communication it's also insanely difficult. Yeah. Does anyone, anyone have an idea why? Yeah, um, does anyone know why? Like some problems that may arise. Think about like how uh, in certain code uh, you know, if, if you take an EE3, like the car code, whenever you like try to uh, read information from your MCU, like if you notice it's super laggy. And if you can try to like reason why it's super laggy, that could help you come up with an answer for this. No, I'm not going to click the next button because someone has a guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that person. Okay, I guess so. Um, it has to do with the timing and delay of how uh, code is uh, essentially run on our MCU. So, in the most basic code, if you try to implement a delay, it stops everything from running. So, it'll wait for that delay to finish before it moves on to the next line of code. And we don't want that because we also need to be, uh, we need, we still need to run other, uh, other information, whether it be like sending data, receiving data, all at, at a rapid pace. And on the other hand, oh, not on the other hands, <laughs> our, our program will take time that isn't calculated into our duty cycle and communication. So uh, that means like if you try to delay and you, you still delay at like a really rapid pace, to like simulate PWM, then you're still cutting off of all the other information that your MCU could be sending or receiving and that's suboptimal. And uh, PWM pins, thankfully, they have in our MCU, they have internal timers that are built in. So um, I believe ours has like eight channels or something like that. Um, it's timer one to timer eight. And I believe each of them have four channels as well. And I think, um, three or four. Hmm? I think it's four channels. Oh, four channels and they each have, yeah, okay. Yeah, so we have several timers and each have four channels and um, they have an internal clock so that they're able to send out a PWM signal without the user having to like super jankily implement a, a PWM on off switching that will interfere with the rest of their code. And the same goes with uh, I2, I2C squared and SPI, but we'll, we won't go into that too great detail with that for now. Just know that these pins are capable of being initialized with I2C or SPI functionality. And we'll uh, tell you which pins to use. Oh, no, we're not telling you which pins. Oh, we're not? Yeah, they're going to oh, find Just itself. kidding. You'll have to figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, next that brings us to oscillators, which are actually really important for a quad. So um, our MCU technically does have a clock source inside. So all MCUs, they require a clock source in order to execute instructions. They can't just like send out information randomly. They have to like operate on a clock. And uh, internally, they do have one, but it's not accurate and uh, in our application with our high frequency transmission but with the high high frequency transmission of data we need ac more accurate timing and uh, to pr produce this accurate timing we're using an external clock in order as opposed to the internal one on the MCU oh and uh, so choosing uh, with regards to choosing an oscillator there are crystal oscillators, which are super precise, but require decoupling capacitors in order to filter out potential noise during its operation. 
And there's another type called resonators that require external, uh, that don't require any external devices, but they're significantly less precise compared to their crystal counterparts. And for our application, as we said, because, uh, uh, because we want really precise communication, we want to use a crystal oscillator with a frequency that's compatible with the MCU. And that information is also available in the data sheet. And on the right is like a typical, it's like an example uh, crystal oscillator like uh, circuit where you have these two decoupling ca capacitors on the outside and then they're, uh, they're connected to some pins on an arbitrary MCU. Yeah. And one of the reasons that we really want a really uh, a good oscillator is being able to push the frequency higher. The way that calculations work is it within the MCU is also using uh, registers. Um, that's how like pretty much all digital logic works. Um, so in order for us to increase the calculation speed of it, um, then we need uh, to have a good oscillator. And the reason we want to increase calculation speed is because if you take in like, like 33B, where you talk about like um, how uh, like time domain, like signals, uh, uh, variables might work, um, and all, or like 141B even, like control systems, everything's kind of studied in the time domain where you have like a continuous time and you can like perfectly at any given time, like output whatever control input you want. But in, in our case, we really, we only have did, like discrete signals where it's like at this point, oh, the acceleration is this much, at this point, the acceleration is this much. So if the faster we are able to calculate, the less delay we introduce to um, our control to whatever the drone's actual physical orientation is. So um, having this good is really important. Yeah. Additionally, um, this past, uh, this year, we decided to tran transition to uh, Cube ID for this very reason. So in the past, we, we used Embed as a development environment. And then apparently that didn't even let us use oscillators that we soldered onto our, MC uh, onto our PCBs. And so as a result, occasionally we'd actually get like super muddled readings from the, uh, from our uh, IMU. And then nobody knew why until this summer, like uh, one of the past AP leads, Kenny Chan, he was like, oh, so it turns out Embed doesn't actually let us use our oscillators. So they've been kind of useless up until this year. No. Mm. Last thing, this also needs a specific pin on the MCU, so. Yes. And so next we have our reset switch. And uh, I guess it's pretty self-explanatory. You just press the reset switch and your entire, uh, and your to quad like resets. And so the reset key is mechanical. And this means that it'll be, its uh, response to input will be especially bouncy with respect to uh, voltage spikes. And we'll debounce it as shown in the circuit to the right. So we need a capacitor in order to, it's pretty similar to, uh, what's the closest thing to that? I guess like uh, similar in function to like a flyback diode, except not a diode. And instead it's a capacitor where, uh, I guess on the next slide, we can kind of explain it. Yeah, so um, if you didn't have a, uh, if you didn't have a capacitor, it'll, it, once you like close the switch, it'll spike really rapidly because your, your current has nowhere to go. And uh, so that's the whole purpose of the capacitor is to essentially smooth it out and reduce this unwanted noise in the circuit. And so when, uh, for the reset switch, when the reset line is low, it can't instantly return to a digital high because of an RC time, an, an inherent RC time constant. And that's where the uh, capacitor comes in. And so uh, the MCU does have uh, information on how you're supposed to connect a reset switch. And uh, it also designates a specific pin as well. So uh, you're gonna have to read up on that when you're designing your schematic. Okay, so yeah, that that's it for today. Is there any questions about all the the, the topics heard? Yeah, sorry, today's lecture was on the slightly longer side. Uh, I have a question about the SPI data transmission. So I'm yeah. just wondering, how many radio devices are we gonna have? One. Okay. One. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, UART, uh, the reason they don't, they don't use the UART is because the stop and start bits often introduce a lot of errors. Um, it's, it, it's a really pre like preliminary form, but everyone kind of uses SPI. 
Okay. And in that case, yeah, so uh, the checkpoint two will be due. Um, yeah, we gave Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. That's where design review is going to be. Actually, what time is it? Oh, sorry, what, what week is it right now? Is it week six? I think it's week five, six. I don't know. All the weeks are the same now. <laughs> yeah, does anyone know what week it is? I think it's six. It is six. Oh, shoot, it's already six. What the heck? No. It's not that much time. Yeah. Okay, I was thinking about delaying it, but I think the earlier you get this out, the easier it will be on you during final week. So um, put it here. If, if you really can't make it, let us know like early on. If you have if you're really busy week eight or something, but we're gonna have checkpoint two uh, week eight Wednesday Thursday Friday. Um, so sign up for your design reviews. Um, so you're gonna for I know a lot of you already made the PowerPoint for this one, which is good. Uh, you can probably keep a lot of it if unless you uh, change it. Um, uh, but you're you're gonna have a uh, PowerPoint, and this will be a lot more formal, and it might take a little bit longer. Um, but we're gonna point out errors and go much more in detail to make sure all your values and everything are exactly what you say it is. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and then we're going to have a, a give you suggestions for a short, maybe even like remote, like we'll just check it off for you remotely. Um, or maybe long if you like it doesn't really work at all. Round of design reviews in week nine. The thing is about this is that um, if we if you, if you and your group can't finish it by that time, um and you don't come to us normally we're pretty lenient but this time we can't really be lenient simply because we have to order these parts for you guys so you can get as soon as possible um so yeah just keep that in mind um what you have to finish is the mcu and the past developments that are connected to it uh, the radio and the imu for the radio and the imu um listen very carefully to this part uh because i don't know if we put in the spec or on the slides here but um you're going to have to put headers on i we oh wait no we have a we have a something in the library right yeah it's in the it's in the ap library oh never mind yeah so those will just be pins that we're going to solder on and then you're going to like stick it in the headers um kind of like an arduino is like pinouts um and that's what things are going to be connected to if you're wondering um and then so for yeah then we're going to also need programming pins, which is just uh, pins for us, uh, our, our programmer, to be able to communicate and upload the program into the microcontroller. Um, and then the oscillator, and then we want to connect all the parts together so that everything is working as it should be. Yeah, we went through announcements already, but remember to sign up for design review. Um, definitely come to the social TV info session. And then look at idea hacks and maybe apply to it. So you get, a, I think you get, you get to keep the parts. Because I think you do. Yeah, because they, they're shipping out parts this year. Yeah, I think you might be able to keep parts. I don't know, but definitely it would be worth your time. Um, yeah, and just don't forget that we're always here to help you guys. Um, question. Ooh. Ooh. When's the last day to sign up for idea hacks? That's a good question. That is a really good question. I'm gonna check that real quick. Yeah. Check. Yeah. So some like general updates for schematics that I want to listen to right now that um I, throughout the design reviews I kind of remembered. One is take the PMOS out of the bomb. That was just an exercise, and I hope that helped you guys understand the issues better. So yeah, we we're not gonna order PMOS, so you can take that out of the bomb. Um, and just a reminder for the bomb, we're not going. Well, of course, we're gonna check it. But if you guys like put the value or the link that's like different from what we said, uh, from what you guys told us, or like you guys forget, like for example, last year a team just like designed a reset switch and didn't put it in their bomb. We're we have like a lot of teams orders, so we might not catch that. Uh, so just everything that is on the bomb will be ordered. That's like we're, for our job, we're taking the bomb and then giving it to our treasure, and we're just ordering whatever's on it. So um, just make sure that it's consistent with what is on your schematic. Um, the second thing is, we didn't mention this, but there should also be a 0 0.1 microfarad capacitor in parallel at the battery. Um, and the reason for this is just to filter a high frequency noise. Um, this is kind of brought up late last year, so, and I suddenly remembered it. Uh, and then the last thing is, before the, last, the next, before the next design review, go back and label your resistors and capacitor values and inductor values uh, for the next design review. It'll make it a lot easier for us to match what you guys say to what your, is on your bomb. 
Um, and it also must be much easier when you're actually soldering it because um, you can reference what values where. Um, yeah, and other than that, it's like really good job. A lot of the design reviews were really impressive. Um, you, guys, you guys actually did really well, um, much better than like past years, I think. So, yeah, um, super good job, everyone. Yeah, really good job, guys. That was a, it was very very nice to see. Oh, uh, also Newton, last day to sign up for uh, ID Hacks is November fifteenth. Oh shit! <laughs> oh, oh I, I might do it. Yeah. But yeah, everyone did super well. Eric and I were like, wow. What a pleasant surprise. <laughs> yeah. cool. Any 